Hello, welcome back to the Offspring Magazine podcast. This is Xiaoran, and I will be hosting today's podcast with me. Today, we will talk with Professor Ferdi Schut. He's the director of Max Planck Institute of Conversion in Mülheim and Der Ruhr, Germany. Today's conversation is about energy system in the near future. I hope you will enjoy today's podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today's podcast, and uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us. Please introduce yourself. I'm Fred Schut, 62 years old. I'm a chemist by training. Uh, still work as a chemist, not only by training a chemist, but still work as a chemist. I'm director here at the Max Planck Institute for Kohlenforschung. I'm interested in many things, uh, the science and catalysis, energy, uh, but but also other things, uh, I, I get easily interested in things. So what kind of researchers that are your group doing currently? Um, we work mostly on catalysis, catalyst synthesis, nanostructured catalysts, and particularly high on my list of interests, and actually that's what most people in the group do, is currently electrochemistry. Uh, and uh, mechanochemical reactions, Bohlmann reactions, which mm -hmm. fascinate me because this is so little understood, and everything which is not really understood is fascinating. Everything which is predictable and well known is kind of boring, I would say. So yeah. it needs to be it needs to be questions around. Uh, can you explain, like uh, specifically about electrochemistry? What are you doing about uh, this? aspect? Um, well, what, what interests me most is actually reactions at the anode of an electrochemical cell. Mm -hmm. So if, if we think about future energy systems in which hydrogen may play a major role, mm -hmm. then the hydrogen is produced at the cathode of an electrolyzer. Mm -hmm. At the anode of an electrolyzer, oxygen is produced. And what do we do with the oxygen? We let it into the atmosphere. And then it's gone. So it is not creating any, any value, but it is the more difficult of the two reactions. Hydrogen evolution is way easier than oxygen evolution. So oxygen evolution makes it difficult, but we throw it away. Yeah. And it would be interesting to couple hydrogen evolution with something which actually generates value at the anode side of an electrolyzer. There is one example every so freshman chemist knows when you produce chlorine it's an electrochemical production mm -hmm. so you produce chlorine at the anode and the hydrogen which you produce at the cathode is actually the byproduct but in future energy system we are interested in the hydrogen and we want to produce something value generating on the anode and we look at different reactions which really uh, can, can be used at high production volumes because otherwise in, in, in the framework of the energy system it doesn't help you if you produce a thousand tons per, per year. You need massive volumes and so one we are interested in is producing purine dicarboxylic acid. That's something we can make from biomass and could replace the uh, terephthalic acid for PET um, polymers. So that would be an interesting one. We also have one where sugars are eventually converted to adipic acid. Adipic acid goes into nylon production. So these polymer production processes are the ones which are really used at, at massive production volume. So that, that's the kind of reactions which is interesting to us. And so we, we try to find ways to do that on the anode uh, to, well, make essentially the cathode reaction, which we are really interested in achieving. Why do you think hydrogen would play a, like an important role in future energy system? Like what well, will be? Yeah, if, if you look at our current energy system, it's mostly based on fossils. Yes. 
everyone knows we want to get away from fossil to replace uh, the, the combustion processes in cars, power plants, which will be CO2 and contribute to global warming. And the, the way to do it is renewables. I would say we currently have three big types of renewables. It's biomass, uh, it is wind, and it is solar, photovoltaics essentially. And both wind and photovoltaics generate as the primary product electricity. Electricity has the problem, unless we have really good and big batteries, that it needs to be consumed as it is produced. And so we have a problem with storage, both short time but also seasonal storage, uh, at least in parts of the world. Moreover, uh, the, the both the wind and the sun are unevenly distributed over the world. Not as unevenly as hydrocarbons on the ground, but still unevenly distributed. And so we would need to bring <clears throat> the electricity from the areas where they are produced, Australia, North Africa, uh, the, the deserts in the US, the deserts in South America, uh, or the coasts where we have high winds, and which are typically not densely populated, to the centers where we consume the electricity. So, of course, we all know we can use cables, but cables over 10,000 kilometers is, is long. I mean, it's not, not uh, un, um, undoable. High voltage direct current can be transported over very long distances, but still, you need the agreement of everyone on the line. You may need to have the cables under the ocean, which is doable, but again, costly and difficult. And so, and we still need then to buffer the uneven, uh, the, the, the temporarily uneven uh, generation of electricity. And hydrogen, or let's put it more broadly, a material chemical is, is a good method to transport energy because you can use high energy content chemicals, transport them and then convert them to low energy content chemicals. Like simplest case, hydrogen, high energy content, we burn it, produce water, low energy content. And so since we need both the transportation function and the storage function, I think hydrogen will be an important element in the future energy infrastructure. On top of that, um, a substantial contributor to CO2 emissions and thus global warming is also chemical production. Uh, ammonia, for instance, but also the other chemicals uh, are, are responsible for, for a substantial footprint uh, in CO2. And we could essentially convert the whole chemical industry to a sustainable basis if we have enough hydrogen. Uh, if you look at a, at a flow chart of chemical production globally, painting with a very broad brush, um, the chemical industry produces, depends on the source where you look at, but let's say several 10,000 different compounds. Now you could have look at each of the several 10,000 different compounds and try to find out how can I make that production sustainable. Or we can look at our feedstocks, the intermediate steps, the final steps, and look at the feedstocks. And if you look at the feedstocks, we basically in the chemical industry have approximately a handful of really important molecule types. It's aromatics, it's olefins, which have the olefin value chain, it is nitrogen, hydrogen for ammonia production as a single one, and then we have methanol for C1 chemistry. That mm -hmm. captures basically almost the whole feedstock basis of the chemical industry. If we can make this feedstock basis sustainable, we don't have to worry about the rest. We just have the entry point as a sustainable one. And if we have enough hydrogen, this is doable, because with enough hydrogen, we could hydrogenate CO2 even, capture it from the air or from point sources, we have methanol. 
from methanol, we can make by the methanol to olefins process ethylene and propylene and adjust the ratios even by running the process properly. Or we can produce the ethylene from bioethanol by dehydration, also a sustainable entry point into the value chain. Hydrogen, we make renewably anyway. Nitrogen, we get from the atmosphere. Aromatics are the only one which is a bit more difficult, uh, but lignocellulose consists of approximately 30% aromatics, and that's the biggest chemical produced in the world by all plants. And so if we have all the aromatic feeds from lignocellulose, if we have the olefin feeds from methanol to olefins, if we have the C1 feed from methanol, and the ammonia feed from nitrogen and hydrogen, we are more or less set. And so even if, if the hydrogen would not be important at all for the energy system, it would be extremely important to put the components to on a sustainable basis. And so hydrogen will be a very crucial molecule in the future. So I guess here, I mean, essentially we're talking about a hydrogen economy, right? And yeah. just for the listeners that maybe aren't so aware of this, can you maybe define exactly what a hydrogen economy is? And then we can start talking more about it. I, I, I actually wouldn't call it hydrogen economy. Ah, okay. Uh, I, I would call it a sustainable energy slash production future. And hydrogen is an important element. Mm -hmm. The more important element will actually be electrons. So we will have lots of electrification. All our transport or most of our transport will be electric, battery electric vehicles. Um, heating will go to electric. So instead of our gas-fired heating, we will have heat pumps probably or resistive heating or solar heating, direct solar heating, depending where we are on the globe. And then we have hydrogen for chemical production. So it will be a major element in a future energy production infrastructure. Uh, for instance, also for making steel. Currently we yeah. make steel from reduction of iron ores by coke. Mm -hmm. uh, there is processes where you can do it with hydrogen. And so we would, we would make steel production maybe not fully sustainable, but much more sustainable. So hydrogen is an element in many different uh, um, production processes and energy processes in the future. I wouldn't go so far, call it hydrogen economy. We are yeah, also not calling our current economy the hydrocarbon economy. One could. But, yeah. Uh, so, but I mean, currently we are much, much more relying on hydrocarbons than we will on hydrogen and on, on hydrogen. Yeah, current, yeah. That, that's what I want to say. Currently, we are relying to a much higher extent on hydrocarbons than we will in the future energy system on hydrogen. Yeah. So yeah. The, the, the relative importance in the overall system of hydrogen will be smaller than hydrocarbons nowadays. Yeah. But then it's all about, you know, what you want is you want to be generating this hydrogen sustainably. Like, yes. like you said. And I mean, so any, any hydrogen which we, do, which we, produce with a big CO2 footprint. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't make, make sense. sense at all. It doesn't make sense and at all. And we may as well exactly. just burn the natural gas or whatever. Exactly, I agree. So how much of the hydrogen currently is produced sustainably? I don't know the number. I'm is pretty it... sure less than 5%. Yeah. Okay, so we still have a long way to go to be able to generate 100% of yes. our hydrogen in yes. a sustainable manner. Yes, I, I mean, not... Of, of course, we have a long way to go. We need much, much more hydrogen in the future. If we want to convert, like I described before, the chemical industry yeah. to a hydrogen basis, this will explode. The, the, the also, because it's not just about converting the current chemical industry. If we're going to keep on growing, the chemical industry will be growing exponentially, especially with... Maybe, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, maybe we shouldn't grow it exponential because our biggest, I wouldn't really call it sustainable, but our biggest hydrocarbon source, which we could tap into, is actually waste plastics. So mm. if we would recycle more, yeah. we wouldn't need to grow exponentially. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, are, we are talking about 
several hundred, hundred million tons per year plastic waste. And that's hydrocarbons. If you, I mean, of course, there's some chlorine in there from, from PVC, there is uh, oxygen in there from PET, there is nitrogen in, in there from polyamides, but the backbone is hydrocarbons. So if we could recycle these waste streams in a way to recover the hydrocarbons, we actually can replace many of the current feedstock by just recycled plastics. That, that's the biggest, volume-wise, by far the biggest uh, uh, product of the chemical industry. All the different types of plastics, much more important volume-wise, weight-wise than, uh, than all the other ones. So we don't need to necessarily grow exponentially, but still the hydrogen needs to be produced in a, in a sustainable manner. It may, however, not take so long to switch to a more sustainable production than one would think in building electrolyzers all over the world, because at least for a transition period, if we would be willing, and I think we should, to enter uh, carbon capture and sequestration, or more precisely carbon dioxide capture and mm -hmm. sequestration, we could generate the so-called blue hydrogen, which is hydrogen made from natural gas by orthothermal reforming or steam reforming, capture the CO2, put it on the ground in an aquifer or, or in a storage site, and then we essentially have hydrogen, which is produced without CO2 footprint and without the need to have electrolyzers because it will take decades to have the electrolyzer capacity deployed all over the world to produce green hydrogen with this amount. So for a transition period, I think blue hydrogen would be an acceptable solution. And blue hydrogen, or let's say the, the CCS, carbon dioxide capture and sequestration, which we would do in connection with, with blue hydrogen would be important anyway, because we have sectors in, in our civilization which are called the hard to abate sectors, cement production. Yeah. I mean, cement is made by firing lime stone and silica and, and uh, that, that's the essential component. Limestone is calcium carbonate. We need to convert it to calcium oxide and there is chemically no way around reducing the CO2. So what are you going to do with the CO2? almost maybe the simplest is capture it, put it away on the ground. And so we need these technologies, these so-called negative emission technologies, which actually do not emit CO2, but where we actually remove CO2. Mm -hmm. We need them anyway, because we have the hard to abate sectors and to offset the emissions from the hard to abate sectors, we may need to remove CO2 from the atmosphere in any case. You mentioned like uh, this blue hydrogen, green hydrogen. I think there are also green. Oh, there is a whole there is a whole color yeah, 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 color yeah, yeah. code of hydrogen. Blue and green are and gray are the, the yeah. better known ones. There there are other ones. Maybe you could uh, like uh, explain later. Otherwise, only it's my okay. So so gray, green, and blue are relatively well defined. Mm -hmm. Gray is the one which you make. By, by orthothermal reforming or steam reforming from hydrocarbons, either methane, oil, or uh, others. Uh, you, you can even get worse. We may call that black hydrogen. You can reform coal. Oh. Mm -hmm. Then you have even more CO2 emissions per hydrogen generated. So th this is why we have different shades of gray. Let's put it like this. We have green hydrogen. That's the one we make by electrolysis. So water, electricity, hydrogen, oxygen production. We have blue hydrogen, which is essentially the same as gray hydrogen, but the CO2 produced is captured and put on the ground in storage sites. There is a purple hydrogen. Now I have to think to, to get it correct. Purple is mostly used for hydrogen where you uh, split methane into carbon and hydrogen, which you can also do. Uh, you don't have to go from methane by reforming to syngas and then shift the action, but you can split it directly to carbon and hydrogen and then put the carbon away in old coal mines, for instance, put the carbon back where we took it from. So 
instance, there would also be hydrogen without CO2 emissions. And then there are different color codes for reddish hydrogen, which is hydrogen produced by electrolysis, but not with solar energy, but with nuclear energy. So this is sometimes also called yellow hydrogen. <laughs> so as I said, the, the, the gray, blue, green is pretty clearly defined. For the other ones, there are different explanations in different parts of the world. But you mentioned we can produce hydrogen by electricity, but I think there are some groups uh, uh, which are working on photocatalysis to use the yes. solar power directly. Yes. That lead water. Yes. What do you think about this technique? Fascinating. Yeah. Scientifically highly interesting. I don't think it will be the basis of big technology. And the reason is that, uh, I mean, at the end, it always comes down to a cost question. I mean, everything in the energy system is governed by cost. And often it's very low margin processes. So cost is very important. Now, the, the current efficiencies of photocatalytic splitting are relatively low. And a solar cell plus an electrolyzer is extremely efficient. I mean, we always say evolution, the green plants, they have optimized everything so well and they are really good in energy harvesting. They aren't. If you look how much a field produces on a square meter basis, the, a field of normal plants harvests on the order of 1% of the solar energy. So 1% of the solar energy is used and used to create plants, biomass, energy content biomass. If we take a run-of-the-mill solar cell, not a high efficient research cell, a run-of-the-mill solar cell you buy in the store and put on the roof, 20% efficiency, 20% of the sunlight converted to electricity. An electrolyzer added to it, and we take a bad electrolyzer, which has maybe 60% efficiency. Then we have 12% overall efficiency over the cycle, sunlight to an energy content chemical. So we have beat nature by a factor of 10. We are 10 times better than nature in photosynthesis. It's not better. No. That's actually pretty good. Uh -huh. no. And this will be difficult to beat with a, with a photocatalytic water splitter. Then if you have your photocatalytic water splitter, there would be a system, you have a puddle of water or big plastic bags of water and a catalyst in there floating in the water, sun light shines on it and the catalyst would split the water to hydrogen and oxygen. We have a number of problems which I think at least suggests that it will be difficult to compete with electrolyzer in a photovoltaic cell. First of all, you have to separate the hydrogen and the oxygen. Otherwise, you have canal gas, the explosive mixture which you don't want to have. So that, that's the first challenge. Can probably be done. But the other challenge you then have is that you have a distributed field. I mean, this, this is massive installation, square kilometers of plastic bags with water and the photocatalyst. And you generate a gas, and what you then need is piping, compressors, dryers, to direct the gas to a central storage location from each of these bags. This is what is called in, in technology the balance of plant. It's, it's not the system which does the work itself, but all the periphery which is used to handle it. This is compared to just cables in an electrolyzer photovoltaic cell system. And frankly, I don't see that the photocatalytic splitting system with all the piping, gas handling system required, distributed over square kilometers, will at the end be cheaper than just a solar cell and a central electrolyzer. I may be wrong, I may eat my words, but if I had to bet money, I would place all my money on electrolyzer plus. Are you sure all of your money? 
all of the money I want to invest in it. Okay. <laughs> so does your group research, do like what kind of research you do at the Institute currently dealing with hydrogen? Um, with hydrogen, we actually, as I said, we look at the anode reaction in yeah. my particular yeah, exactly. group. So that, that's essentially electrolyzer work, yeah. hydrogen electrolyzer work. We also look at fuel cells, which is the inverse reaction of the electrolyzer. So taking hydrogen and burning it, not with a flame, but converting it in an electrochemical device, generating electricity yeah. out of the hydrogen again. So we try to improve fuel cell catalysts. Uh, there's Michael Felderhoff's group uh, working on uh, hydrogen storage and heat storage, which can actually be combined in an intelligent way, uh, because we also would need to store heat maybe in the future, which is currently already being done. You store heat in the summer and use it for heating in the winter. There, yeah. you, you can actually do seasonal storage by just big water tanks. And Michael tries to do it a bit more intelligently. Uh, Claudia's group, and we have also done that before in, in my own group, is working on ammonia splitting, which could be a very interesting reaction in a future energy system because in a future system, let's say we produce the hydrogen in the Australian desert and we want to bring it to Central Europe. How are you going to do it? You won't have a compressed hydrogen ship. The density is ridiculously low, even if you compress it to very high uh, pressures of, so let's say, 700 bar, which is difficult uh, in, in a volume like you have on a ship. So you, th th there is different way now so ways now of transporting it. The maybe most obvious one is liquefied hydrogen. Yeah. So go to minus 254 centigrades or whatever it is, liquefy it and have it in a cryotanker like we do with liquefied natural gas. Generally doable, has been an experimental transport actually from Australia to Japan, has been done on a relatively small scale. Mm -hmm. That ship lost a lot of hydrogen because mm -hmm. it boils off. Of course, you can use part of that hydrogen to power the ship. So the gas hydrogen, which boils off, you would feed in the turbine of the ship and power the ship with it. But still, they need, we need improvements there. And there are people who, who don't believe in transporting liquid hydrogen. I'm not so sure. There, I wouldn't place all my money on, on one solution. Uh, another form would be ammonia. Ammonia is relatively economically, also energy economically synthesized. It's one of the most efficient processes because it has been optimized over 100, more than 100 years. Uh, produce ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen, ship the ammonia then at the target uh, site, either use the ammonia as a fertilizer or you decompose the ammonia again to nitrogen and hydrogen. And then you use the hydrogen. So ammonia decomposition, making that more efficient, making ammonia decomposition cheap, could actually be a very important element in the future energy infrastructure if we ship the hydrogen in form of ammonia. We may use methanol as the form to ship hydrogen. As I said, you could basically, if you convert the chemical industry to sustainable basis, it all goes back to hydrogen, but the intermediate form for most value chains is then methanol. And so that's also a good way of transporting hydrogen. Uh, so how do we arrive here? Oh, okay, because I said Claudia is working yeah. on ammonia yeah. decomposition, so that, that could be an important element in a, in a future energy infrastructure. So yeah, I mean, I'm absolutely fascinated by the idea of producing your electricity in different parts of the world and then transporting. Um, and being able to get this electricity in Europe, say, especially when we're dealing with solar or wind, like Europe's not the best for this, and there's definitely other places. Um, and the ammonia is actually interesting. I'm not too, I don't know too much about the current technologies on how to decompose ammonia. It's a, it's relatively straightforward. You take a catalyst, 500 centigrades, flush mm -hmm. it over the catalyst, and it decomposes into nitrogen and hydrogen. And Simply speaking. Then you need to separate, but nitrogen and hydrogen is not a big deal. That, that's a relatively simple. So what are kind of like ways to make this process better? 
Like what are what are what are you, the ways you, forward? You 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 do need the temperatures because thermodynamically, in order yeah. to decompose completely, you would need these high temperatures. So there is no question about it. But you want the catalyst to be better so that you can build the plants smaller. You want a very good heat integration of your system. So since you do have to supply these 455 minutes centigrade somehow, and that's that's a key in many parts of the chemical industry anyway, you have many processes which interact in a way that you have excess heat here and you use it to drive the process three plants down the road. Mm -hmm. And so the, the standalone ammonia decomposition plant is maybe not a very good idea because then you have to produce the heat somehow. If you can couple it with another process which generates the heat anyway, that would be much better. And so making plants smaller, make a catalyst more efficient. You also don't want lots of ammonia slip. Ideally, you want to have one pass and it's decomposed. Everything is done. That, that, that would be interesting. Since we talked about the decomposition of the ammonia, then if you want to transport hydrogen by ammonia, then you need to produce ammonia. Yes. So normally how we produce ammonia and uh, nowadays the best uh, like solution to produce the ammonia, like what do you think about that? Well, the, the, the best solution is essentially still the solution discovered by Haber and Bosch 100 and roughly 10 years ago. Uh, so you pressurize it, you get, go to high temperatures, you pass it over an iron-based catalyst and you get ammonia. Not everything uh, you put in is ammonia. The one pass conversion is typically below 20%, so you have separation and everything. But this process is really optimized nowadays. So the, the energy integration, which I discussed before, for those processes work extremely well. And this is one of the, probably one of the most efficient chemical processes which we are running. Because even if you get a tiny little bit more energy efficient, since we produce so much ammonia in the world, it means a lot to this up to none. Um, whether we will have different ammonia processes remains to be seen. There, there are catalysts which work at lower temperatures by now, but their one pass conversion is so low that the, the current separation technology would not work, and so the separation of the ammonia then kills the economics of the process. So, there have been many attempts, actually, to improve ammonia synthesis. I would say the only really substantial innovation was the introduction of a ruthenium catalyst instead of the iron catalyst, mm -hmm. something like 40 years ago. But currently, still, most of the plants are based on the iron process, and only some of the plants have, in the last stage, downstream of the main process a ruthenium-based catalyst to convert a bit more of the nitrogen and hydrogen to ammonia at lower temperatures. But overall, the old process is so optimized and so good integrated, energy integrated, that it's really difficult. It's really difficult to replace it. The, the only thing where I, where I would say, putting aside the question should, should we transport hydrogen by ammonia? Let's, let's just assume we, we only want ammonia. Mm -hmm. We ask ourselves, do we really want ammonia? No, of course not. Why do we produce ammonia? We want fertilizer. We don't want the ammonia, we want fertilizer. Except the ammonia we need for some productions, for polyamides and so on, some chemical production. But the majority of ammonia goes into fertilizer. And there we don't use it predominantly as ammonia or ammonium, we oxidize it to nitric acid and use nitrate fertilizers. Mm -hmm. Now, we are not interested in ammonia, we are interested in nitrates. So if we have a different way of making nitrates, we don't need ammonia production anymore. And the precursor, or one of the precursors for ammonia production was actually a process uh, called birkeland Eide process operating in the early 1900s, which in German has the, the name Luftverbrennung. 
which means combustion of air, which is exactly what you do. You pass air through an electric arc, and in the electric arc you have several thousand centigrades, at several thousand centigrades nitrogen and oxygen react form NO. Equilibrium at high temperatures is on the side of NO. And then you oxidize the NO homogeneously to the other nitric oxides, and then you can produce nitric acid. So you produce fertilizer without making ammonia. As I said, we are not so much interested in ammonia, we want fertilizer. If we find if we have dirt cheap electricity, and we do have dirt cheap electricity in parts of the world, the lowest bid I know for a photovoltaic plant, I think it was in Saudi Arabia. I mean the the, the way how you nowadays uh, build uh, electricity plants is the, the government or the authorities ask for bids from companies. We want power plant 300 megawatts. How are you going to do it and what will be the cost of electricity? And then typically what the government does, they collect bids and the one who produces at the lowest cost per kilowatt hour gets the permission to build the plant. In some rich parts of the world, lowest cost nowadays are almost invariably photovoltaic plants. And the lowest bid I know was below a cent per kilowatt hour. Now you look at your electricity bill at home, 30 cents, something like that. Of course, this is not just the generation cost, it's the grid uh, uh, cost, it's taxes and so on. But the, the typical costs in Germany for different electricity generation are uh, coal, nuclear, gas, uh, photovoltaic, hydro, power, they are typically, let's say, five cents kilowatt hour plus minus a minute. Gas is more expensive because when you use it short time during the year, um, some may be a bit cheaper, but five is already low. As I said, in some rich parts of the world, a cent per kilowatt hour. It could be that the photovoltaic process reacting nitrogen and oxygen in an arc might become attractive again if you want fertilizer. So one one sometimes one shouldn't just think linearly, but open your view a bit and ask yourself what is the service we want? If, if the service is fertilizer, we can look much more broadly than if the service is ammonia. But as I said, ammonia, we may need to transport the hydrogen. And so we have a different story for ammonia possibly. What about, um, if, we, if we're talking about hydrogen storage systems, we talk about ammonia, uh, what about metal hydrides? Um, I don't think they will be large scale storage systems. Uh, as I said, Michael Feldhoff is working on yeah. metal hydrides. They are really interesting for a combination of hydrogen storage and heat storage because when they react with hydrogen, they typically release heat. Yeah. When they uh, are, are decomposed, you need heat. And so you can shift heat around and at the same time have this material hydrogen, either in gases form where you can use it or in the form of a storage. So there are applications where that could be interesting. Large scale seasonal storage of hydrogen will almost certainly be done uh, underground. So we have caverns. There, there is different ways to store the hydrogen. Is, you, you can do it in so-called aquifers, which is uh, water containing strata in, in the ground. The one which is easier to understand at least for a chemist who is used to work with gas cylinders, is caverns. So we have, especially in northern Germany, we have rock salt formations. Big, really cubic kilometer rock salt domes in, 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 in the ground. And you can leach caverns into these rock salt formations. These caverns we have already nowadays, they are used for gas storage, not for gas storage. Some of them are 
just reached those from rock salt. They have a volume of, or can have a volume of several hundred thousand cubic meters. Gigantic. Wow. And you store the hydrogen in these caverns at pressures above 100 atmospheres. So you compress the hydrogen, you have it in the cavern. Yeah, if you have 100 atmospheres in a 500 cubic meter cavern, that's 50,000 cubic meters of hydrogen, normal temperature and pressure you're storing. We are doing this nowadays, and that will in increase in, in importance. And that's way easier than hydrides and so on. So if you want seasonal storage, hydrogen for the winter to heat, you would do it in the very same way as we do it nowadays with natural gas. And the same formations can hold hydrogen and natural gas. It's, it's not quite as simple, uh, especially in these saline aquifers, the, the water containing formations in the ground, and not the, the salt domes. You may actually have microorganisms which like hydrogen, so they will eat the hydrogen away, they will grow and block the passages and so on. So one has to investigate in detail what you can do, but uh, I, I know several sites where these hundred thousands of cubic meters caverns are used nowadays for storing hydrogen for chemical production actually. There is a site called T site in the US, which is a refinery chemistry site, and there is uh, a so-called Clements Dome in Texas, which is also in a, in a refinery compound where they have, I think Clements is 500,000 cubic meter volume, so these are gigantic. Is and that's what we use for hydrogen in the future, I'm that sure. But just, just from a cost perspective, you just think that it's just going to be cheaper. It, it's, it's way cheaper, way less complex yeah, than, yeah. than a hydride storage system. I mean, what you essentially do is these are leached by just pumping water into the ground. The water dissolves the sodium chloride or potassium chloride. It's taken to the top and then slowly released into the oceans. Uh, you have to be careful not to uh, have too high salt loads on the rivers and so on, but that, that's being done. So you leach them by pumping water into them. If you have them, you basically just simply them. If you have a tube and a valve <laughs> and a compressor, yeah. then this is essentially it. And that, that's proven technology. It works, you don't have to develop anything to do that. So if though you don't see the potential of metal hydrides being used in the future, why are we researching them? No, no, no. I, I, I didn't say I don't see the potential. What I said is it's just not going to replace. It's not the solution for seasonal oh, okay. energy storage. Gotcha. Yeah. But there may be situations like, let's say we have a hydrogen pipeline and uh, or, or also a natural gas pipeline and a compressor running on hydrogen or a gas fired power plant running on hydrogen and we want cogeneration of heat and mm -hmm. uh, electricity. You may use a metal hydride for storing the hydrogen as a, as a fuel for your power plant, but the hydride also for the heat. And by choosing the right hydride, you can actually control the temperature level at which the heat is released. So this is depending to what metal the hydride yeah, is. Exactly. So let's say a magnesium hydride is around 300 centigrades. Mm -hmm. Magnesium iron hydride is at somewhat higher temperatures. And so if you have, let's say, a chemical production, or let's say you have an ammonia release. I was just thinking of that. Like you have the ammonia, you have an ammonia the heat with the metal hydride. Yeah. You may be able yeah. to to uh, have the heat with the metal hydride. I mean, of, of course, th this is not the only two elements in a in a big infrastructure. But th th there is use cases for the hydrides, as there are use cases for the, the caverns. Large scale seasonal storage one would probably not use the hydrides that's yeah. caverns but in other applications the hydrides make make perfect sense yeah. and so i mean an energy system and an energy future will be very colorful it, it will not be just 
the red or green or yellow picture. It will be a very colorful picture. We will have many different components. Easily. Actually, now we talk about hydrogen production, storage, transportation. And actually, when uh, you mentioned metal hydride, I was thinking, actually, there are groups that are working on to use hydrogen, like metal hydride, as a hydrogen storage materials. Then you can use it on car. Then it's, no. it, it sounds not, yeah. But, uh, but since at the beginning you mentioned that now we, in the future, we will use electricity from hydrogen. But I think there are also another idea. You can use hydrogen as a fuel directly. Yes. You have this combustion yes. system to fuel the car. Yeah. Yes. I wouldn't do it. <laughs> no, no, I mean, several reasons. Metal hydrides as the storage medium in a car, we did research on this for about 20 years in the department. And my bottom line is this is not going to work. <laughs> no, because you don't reach the storage capacities which yeah. you would need. Uh, and so I, I don't believe that this is doable. The technology which we'll probably have in the future is just a pressure tank, maybe liquefied. Um, I don't see fuel cells as a big solution for passenger cars anyway. Mm -hmm. Passenger cars will be battery loaded to the units of the, 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 the batteries have such a trajectory of getting better. Mm -hmm. This will not be eaten by hydrogen. I'm pretty sure about that. So all the passenger cars, I think, will on the long run be battery electric. For heavy duty, applications, the jury is still out. So there, there was estimates that in about 10 years, either hydrogen and the fuel cell or batteries for heavy duty will be as cheap as diesel. So, and what the split between battery heavy duty trucks and fuel cell heavy duty trucks is, is totally unclear. The battery trucks are actually making progress at a astonishing pace. Um, but I think we will have some heavy duty machinery, heavy duty trucks based on hydrogen in the future and fuel cells. I think we will have that. One has to say, however, that if we take internal combustion engine, hydrogen fuel cell engine, battery engine, the efficiency goes dramatically up. Internal combustion engine, overall efficiency, energy content of the fuel to driving, so mobility, about 25%. Fuel cell systems level, energy content of the hydrogen to mobility, roughly 50%. Battery, depending on the charge discharge currents, the more the, the higher the currents are, the more losses you have. But if, if your currents are relatively low, so you charge low current overnight, you drive gently, 90% efficiency. So, uh, just from an energy conservation point and energy use point, battery is the best solution. How much money will you bet on this this side? All of your money? On, on passenger car? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, I, again, hydrogen. I would place all my money on, on that electric. Yeah. yeah. But for the heavy duty vehicles and long term, like heavy duty, case. heavy duty for long haul. I mean, for for short distances in the city, last mile, better. Yeah, for sure. Long haul across the Alps. That's a difficult question. There, I would probably place two thirds of my money on battery and one third on fuel cell. Oh. <laughs> okay. Hmm. And what we haven't spoken about is aviation. Yeah, that's yeah. a totally different. That's story. a diff it's difficult. I mean, so. first of all, we focus when we when we discuss our CO two emissions, we focus very often on aviation, how evil it is yeah. that we are flying. Overall, less than 2% of the total emissions. Every percent counts, but 
they're as big a fish to fry. Having said this, it's still important to do something about it. Aviation is not going to work with batteries. I'm not totally sure about hydrogen. Airbus has announced they will have a hydrogen powered plane in the air, I think by 2032 or something. Uh, it's, not to, it's not clear at this point what kind of plane it will be, whether it will be a jet plane or whether they will be fuel cells to have a propeller a plane or whatever, but they want a hydrogen powered plane in the air by. I think it was 2032, but uh, I think for most of our aviation needs for decades, we will be stuck with hydrocarbons because you need this energy density of 40 something megajoules per kilogram, mm -hmm. which you cannot get uh, at least on a systems basis with hydrogen or any other technology. On the other hand, we can have sustainable aviation fuels. We can have biofuels, we can have fissure trash fuels made from biomass or municipal waste or whatever. We can even hydrogenate CO2 by fissure trash technology after reverse water gas shift and produce aviation fuels which are compliant with all the regulations. That, that's often a showstopper for fuels because the authorities allow only certain fuels on planes. Uh, but the, the, there is a number of approved fuels which you can do on a sustainable basis. So aviation will be a problem which is manageable, but it's going to be hydrocarbons, just sustainable hydrocarbons. I had thought that it actually matters. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. As I said, the Airbus is working on the hydrogen plane, but yeah, yeah, it's going to be a tricky one. But now we're talking about electricity, and basically we produce hydrogen. At the end, we want electricity. We mm -hmm. want electricity. No, we want energy for certain services. Yeah, good. Yeah, good. We are not interested in hydrogen. We are not interested in electricity. Yeah. We want mobility. We want heat. Yes. And we want a TV, a computer, a cell phone. Th that's the services we want. Yes. However, these services are created. We actually don't care whether it's electricity, hydrogen, solar heat, whatever. We want the services. Yes, but yeah, but you put some money on the electricity side. Mm -hmm. We also can produce electricity by nuclear, but why we don't use nuclear energy rather than use like using the hydrogen energy? Um, several several reasons. I mean, when when I was twenty. I, I was, the world was black and white and nuclear was the most evil thing you could do. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I thought this, I was convinced that that was the most evil thing. I'm a bit more relaxed. When you get older, you get more relaxed anyway. Um, but there are a number of downsides for the nuclear. First of all, it's expensive, way more expensive than photovoltaics. So, the, the, and cost is a big driver in the energy system. Second point, I'm, I'm not so much worried, in spite of the accidents we had, I'm not so much worried about the risks in operating the planes. I'm worried about the nuclear waste, which we will have to deal with for long times. Even if there are people who now work on what is called transmutation, so you have the slowly decaying elements, you convert them to quickly decaying elements, and so you don't have to watch the radioactive waste for 500,000 years, but just for 500 years, which is still a long time. Mm. Uh, and the third problem is the more radioactive material is around, the higher is the risk of proliferation. And, uh, I mean, come on, the, the Ukraine war, the Russian uh, war on Ukraine is of course made more complex and more dangerous because Russia is a nuclear power. They, they have nuclear weapons. So I don't want nuclear weapons around. We have them, but we shouldn't increase the chances of proliferating them even more. So the three points cost radioactive waste 
and proliferation of nuclear material for terrorists or states are, I think, are good reasons against nuclear. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of disagree with you on the last one, just because I think that in science, a lot of the times, like when a scientific technology is developed, there's always good and bad to it. Science can be super destructive, of course. but it can have huge benefits. Yes. And I guess there, it's it's the same with nuclear. I just I think nuclear. Yeah, I mean, if you think that the the downsides and the, I think the downsides are outweigh the benefits, the, the upsides, yeah. Then, yeah. then that then that makes sense. Um, and nuclear is not going to get cheaper. That's that's another not thing. I was, I was going to ask. Solar is that. going to get cheaper. Yeah. So I was going to ask actually with price. Like I was just wondering whether maybe nuclear was so expensive right now, just because the demand is still fairly low. So I was just wondering whether if the demand increases, then just. Well, you said if we build more plants. Yeah. My 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 hunch is, although I have no proof, this is just. My hunch is the more nuclear plants we will have, the more awareness would be that this could be a danger and the higher the, the regulations, the more strict the regulations would get and again, it makes, makes it more expensive. Yeah. So I, I think mm -hmm. more nuclear plants would probably rather make it more expensive than cheaper. Mm -hmm. But th this is more a hunch. I don't have yeah, yeah. hard data to prove that. There, there is people who work on call them tiny reactors, but there, there, there is people who work on very small-scale reactors which are supposedly inherently safe, but as I said, the safety during operation is not so much my mm -hmm. concern anyway. Uh, there are accidents and they are evil and it, it's really bad if it happens, but my main concern is cost, waste, proliferation. So about waste though, what about the waste that comes from solar panels? That that's at least not radiating waste. Okay. I would. I mean, let let's say we take the vast majority of the solar panels. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to have mass-produced cadmium selenide or something like yeah. that solar panels. But almost all the solar panels you see on the roofs are silicon. Okay. Um, I was going to ask what kind of metal it could be, but I didn't. I, didn't I don't know. care. I don't care about. And so then the silicon so, I mean, waste silicon, is fine. You throw this. Well, I mean. I wouldn't throw it away. I would recycle it because yeah. reducing the silicon dioxide to silicon and then producing solar grade silicon from it, the reduction step is very energy intensive. So it would be stupid to throw it away, let it oxidize again, become silica again yeah. or quartz again. Um, so we, we, for all large scale technology, we need recycling chains. We also need them for the solar panels because it's not just the silicon. We have uh, copper wiring in there. Mm -hmm. there. There are semiconductor elements for um, rectifiers and so on in, in, in the overall system. And so, of course, we need recycling chains. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm that, that's doable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and as I said, silicon is pretty innocuous. And uh, we know from February of 2022, and uh, your one of science council members in Germany. I think it's Germany's most important adversary and board of science policy. And uh, and we'll also talk about the like the bad side, the good side of science. What do you think about the relationship between science and politics? And how do you navigate your role like as a scientist at the same time? A kind of a consoler for the government. Well, the, the 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 science council consults the government in questions of science policy, not in questions of general policy. Yeah. So, it, and science policy, I feel comfortable with. Yeah. General policy is, in fact, a very different story. My. my general feeling is that science should stay out of politics as much as possible. Um, so let's say that even in the most difficult political times between different countries, there are many examples. Israel, Germany, Russia, Germany, China, Germany, or China and the rest of the world. 
Israel and the rest of what Israel, Germany is, is particularly sensitive situation. Science has always held channels open and allowed to talk and build bridges when politics could not build bridges. And so I, and, and a similar role is actually being played by sports. It doesn't always work. Also sports is political. But I have the feeling that for the overall benefit of the world, it is good if there are communication channels open, even, even very strong adversaries by science. And science and sports are domains in which this may be possible. Um, science cannot totally keep out of politics. And when it comes to scientific results, which influence politics, I think science should not keep out of politics. Let's take Corona. Dealing with the Corona crisis was in many respects a scientific question. If there were scientific results which clearly showed this is what you should do and this is what you should not do. The vaccination was a discovery of science. Um, some of the basics now, how we handle the gas crisis, is a scientific question. What kind of technologies do we have available and on what time scale can we deploy them to replace Russian gas? That's a science and technology question. The political domain has then to draw conclusions from it, but science has to supply the underlying data. I mean, when, when, when the Russian attack on Ukraine happened, I think, Yuri Prodina issued a statement which I authored with a number of colleagues from Leo Prodina, our National Academy, uh, what it would mean for the gas supply of Europe and particularly Germany. And some of the colleagues at the end wanted to have a statement in this, uh, in, in, in this short expertise saying we should uh, we should have an embargo on gas from Ukraine. But the majority of the colleagues said, no, we don't want to do it. We basically try to put down the facts. And then there are many other parameters entering the equation. And based on all these other parameters and the facts, what we can do, you have to draw the conclusion whether we should have an embargo or not. Because politics is typically way more than science. I mean, when, when, let's take again the question of the corona crisis. Of course, it helps limiting the spreading of the virus if you close down the schools. But that has so many side effects, closing down the schools, which are not scientific. They, they, they have to do with values. They have to do with social systems and so on. And science typically sees one section of reality. And a political decision needs to take into account also the other sections from reality. And so science has an influence and should have an influence in politics, but politics is more than science. And so that, that, that's a bit my view on the interaction between science and politics. I think we're running out of time, but uh, did we get to end this session? No. It's I think we can wrap it up now. Okay. Yeah, so you wrap so, it up. <laughs> exactly. So do you wanna yeah, I mean thank you so much for taking out the time sure. to sit down with us. Um I, I learned a lot. Um and so I'm sure that the listeners have as well because if I learned <laughs> we'll I learned see. a lot. Yeah, I, I'm definitely not an expert in this field. So thank you again. Sure. You're thank you very much. Thank you so much for listening. If you would like to learn more about Professor Ferdi Schutt and his research, you could look at his website. If you like our podcast, make sure to tune on every Friday. Thank you. Bye.